So as, as you all know, robotics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, these are all buzzwords that you can not only find in, in research and science anymore, you can find them more and more in public media. So when there is a phase where you have this, this big hype about a, a domain, it's, it's always good to start with a definition. So what is artificial intelligence? Machine learning means software, software algorithms that learn from data. Robotics means we have a connection between a computer system, a digital system that can physically interact with the, with the environment. And we're going to talk about that much, much more in detail today. Um, but taking a step back, so there are self-driving cars. I'm sure that every one of you has, has heard about that. Looking at Apple's Siri, Google's Assistant, Amazon's Alexa. So we're seeing more and more of these technologies entering our everyday lives. And what makes this different? So when it comes to artificial intelligence, what computer software used to be, imagine you had three colors, white, gray, and black and you would ask a, a computer program, what color is this, white, gray, or black, there's a unique answer to this. If you show a photograph to an algorithm and you would ask, who is on this photograph? Then the answer might be, this could be Linda, but maybe it's some, someone else. Or this could be Chris, but it could be someone else. But th the same is true for us humans, right? If I would show you a photograph, in many cases, assuming you know that person, you can tell who is on the photograph. But in many cases, also, you, you're not really sure. It could be that person, but it could be someone else. So we're seeing more and more of these breakthroughs in semantic understanding, speech recognition, speech translation. Now, looking at robotics, let's take a step back to 1997 when um, IBM's Deep Blue bet Gary Kasparov in chess. This is what we, we call artificial intelligence at that point, and I'm sure that you've heard of AlphaGo uh, much more recently. However, I have not yet seen a computer system or a robot that can take a, a box of chess figures, take each individual figure, put it on the board, and physically play chess with me. So let's, let's talk about robotics. What is, what is robotics? Robotics is the intelligent connection between perception and action. So what that means is, on the right side, you can see a, a robot. And the robot has, is installed in some environment, works in some environment. But it's also about physical contact, having the system making physical, physical contact with the environment, possibly with a human. And the robot consists of actuators, in many cases, electrical motors. But there are many other actuators. And then it consists of sensors. So it can sense its own position, it might have a camera for visual perception, it might have a forced talk sensor or a skin for tactile perception. And then we have a, a control system, and what I want to focus on today is, is this control system. So let's, let, me, let me start with something that I've done quite a while ago. Um, this is um, one of the first projects that I did in, in robotics. What you can see here is a robot inserting a battery into a cell phone. The robot is equipped with a force talk sensor, so it can, can feel, but it cannot see the phone, and it doesn't exactly know where the phone is, so you can see that it is, it is displaced. Right? So the, you don't, we don't know the position and orientation of the phone, so we're just feeling, like blindly trying to insert the battery into the phone. And what you can see on the right-hand side is a, a graph. So the graph is static, and each node in this graph is a command for the robot. So depending on the sensor signals from the robot, we take a, a path through this graph um, that really depends on what is happening um, in the robot work cell. Now, when we switch from one node to another, we don't know in what state we are in. So that means we need to be able to switch to react instantaneously, in this case, within like one millisecond, we need to change from one behavior to another. So this is comparable to the human reflex. Here you can see me soldering, and I'm burning my fingers. And these, these reflexes are very often triggered in our spinal cord or in our cerebellum, and we react to pain or something unforeseen right away. And very often, actually not very often, we, we really um, first react and then afterwards, we consciously notice, oh, I just burnt my fingers. 
So we used this technology and we implemented a Jenga playing robot. So Jenga is a parlor game, I'm sure many of you know that. It consists of a tower of wooden bricks. And the goal is to pick a brick, take it out and put it back on the top of the tower. And the robot that we used to play this game was equipped with position sensors in the joints, so the robot knew where it was. It had a forced torque sensor so that it could feel, it had a distance sensor, and it had two cameras. And what you now can, can see, we're now about to, to grasp this one brick of wood. And while we're now trying to, to pull out this, this brick, we're eliminating all transversal forces and torques. And, and we do that to prevent the tower from toppling. Um, and we really have to do this in a very, very careful, careful manner. And this, again, is implemented using the same primitives, the, the same graph principle that you've, that you've seen before. However, now this graph is much more complex. Um, here you can see a view from, from the cameras. And we were actually cheating a little bit, so we, we colored all of the blocks um, with black and white colors so that it's not a computer vision problem. So it, we simplified our task that way. Here you can see the, the, the force torque sensor to really get the, the tactile perception. You can see it in, um, on the real robot and the distance sensor as well. Now, taking a step forward, programming here was, was really a challenge. And looking at the control system, what could we do to kind of make the control system more intelligent, the, the, the green block here on the left? So we could imagine to put a, a human in there, right? So the human is teleoperating the robot, and if the human also gets a sense of touch, then this is what we call haptics. So the human can haptically teleoperate the robot, so the human can feel what the robot is, is feeling. And here's one, one example. This is something that we did at Stanford University. You can see this wealth on the right and the, the robot as well, and this is a haptic device. A haptic device is a, imagine a joystick, and you have force feedback, but with this joystick you, you get force feedback in up to six degrees of freedom. So you can feel exactly what the robot is feeling. So in this case, the human operator can actually see the valve, but of course there could also be a camera so that the operator would only see the, the camera image. Now, obviously that doesn't scale, right? We would need one human per robot, so would be easy to program because it's done by the human, but we can scale that. So we need something else. A much more interesting aspect is actually putting the human not at the teleoperation seat, but have the human and the robot interact, maybe physically interact. So here's another project where you can see um, the robot and the human physically interacting. This actually was a student project at Stanford University um, using this, this framework that I mentioned earlier where we are able to generate motions within less than one millisecond, comparing this is what, what is comparable to the human reflex. And here, the students were able to implement this in, in less than three weeks. And it's actually, it looks complex, but it's, it's very, very simple. So the robot moves towards the, the human sword and the moment we detect the contact, within one millisecond, the robot starts recoiling. Exactly what a human would do as well. And here's the defense mode. Also very simple. All the, all the, the only thing that the human, uh, and, sorry, that the robot tries to do is to put its sword perpendicular to the human sword. You can see that again. So you can see me fighting with the, with the robot. And all the robot is trying to do is to put its, its sword perpendicular to mine, and you can see the 3D camera there and also the camera image in, in the background. Now, looking at this, this actually looks dangerous, right? And imagine you would have humans and, and robots interacting, sharing the same workspace. So safety is something, physical safety for the human is something that really needs to have the highest priority whatsoever. So we don't want to harm, to injure, or even to kill a human, right? So this has to be um, the, the foremost priority for, for roboticists when they work on applications where robots and humans share the same workspace. So we then worked on, on an algorithm 
that allows the robot to prevent from collisions. So you can see on the right-hand side here a, um, a depth image. And based on that depth image, we can detect the human, we can de detect obstacles. And we then compute a velocity vector. So we compute a, a point in space. And the velocity vector is pointing into the opposite direction of the human, into the opposite direction of, of the obstacle. And this way, we can compute a motion in real time that allows the robot to move away from the obstacle in the best possible way, as fast as physically possible. So the robot tries everything it possibly can, it physically can, to prevent from that collision. So that is one trend. But even here, programming, again, is, is very, um, very expensive. There is another development in the domain of robotics research, and that's based on, on, on models, a lot of engineering. We put a lot of um, thought into the controllers, into the motion planners. And when I worked at Google, I had the honor and, and the pleasure to also collaborate with the team at Boston Dynamics. And I would like to give great credits to, to them for the, for the videos we're seeing here. This robot is called Atlas. It's a humanoid robot. Um, and this robot is fully force and torque controlled. And what they were able to do here is to have the robot being able to walk alongside with humans on very uneven terrain to, um, to manipulate objects like here. And there's another robot called, um, called Spot. So this Spot is a um, Spot Mini, to be precise. It's a quadruped robot with an, with an arm on top of it. And what you can see here in this demonstration is, is actually whole body control. So we keep the position of the end effector where it is, and then we move, move around. The latest version of Atlas can even jump. And this is really an amazing achievement that just was um, implemented very recently. And it's not only about jumping. Uh, look ahead. Some of you might have seen this already. So this is really an amazing engineering achievement, and, and credits to the team at Boston Dynamics at this point. However, in all three cases, the graph that you've seen, human-robot collaboration, and the, the latest videos, it requires a lot of skills, expertise, and experience to, to program these robots. So how can we overcome this, this problem? Right? We cannot have, like, people who are highly educated in robotics to program all of these robots. It, it will not work. It will not scale. So this is where machine learning might come to help. And this is ongoing research in many research labs in, in the world, including the ones here in, in Karlsruhe. And machine learning, as I mentioned, means software algorithms that learn from data. Now, data is something that is sometimes hard to find in robotics. So we can find a lot of text and images in the internet to train algorithms. This is why they have become very, very trained in um, speech recognition, image recognition. However, there are not too many websites that show motor currents, motor torques, joint torques, joint positions. Right? We just don't have enough, enough of that data. So the problem we have here is we actually need a lot of data. It's really about data, and, and we come to data-driven robotics. And one experiment that we did at, at, at Google a while ago, this was last year, we had 14 robots trying to grasp objects. And we did that for two months. There's a method that is called reinforcement learning. And that means the robot is, is taking an action. And if it does a, a good action, it gets a reward for it. So in this case, the reward was the success of grasping an object. And we did that, as I mentioned, for about two months. It was a little more than 800,000 grasps. And there was one thing that happened that was truly amazing and, and surprising to us. So look at this scene. You can see the stapler and the yellow Duplo brick here. And now in the next scene here, the robot is trying to grasp the yellow brick. And what it does is it pushes away 
the stapler to then grasp the object. And there was no engineer that wrote a single line of code to do this. This was truly learned by the system. And when we've seen that, this was a, a big surprise and a big success to the, to the entire team there. Now, this is truly amazing. However, even that doesn't scale. Because this works for this robot with this camera, with this gripper. If you change the setup, um, the neural network that was trained will not work anymore. So machine learning is no magic. And we have to be aware of it. It's a tool. And it just means it's a set of algorithms that learn from data. Now, taking a, a stop here, if, if you are interested in, in this domain, in, in robotics, there's a fantastic a book and also a website where you can find hundreds of, of such videos and technologies with descriptions. It's all openly available. And if you take a look at this, um, this book and website, um, I'm, I'm sure you will find more interesting information about these technologies. And now concluding, looking a little bit into the future of what's, what's going to happen next. So we're seeing almost weekly right now technical breakthroughs in visual perception and, and speech recognition. However, the challenges that we are still facing and where we do not yet have good solutions is safe actuation, having robots and humans working together in a, in a safe way, having robots physically manipulating the environment, and having robots and humans working together, sharing the same workspace, and doing that in a, in a safe way. So to conclude, this is what we've seen before, so the intelligent connection between perception and action. Safety is one very important, very fundamental aspect. And data. So this is where we are we're going to see in the next decade more and more breakthroughs as well. And I hope that I will be able to contribute that further. But I would also like to say that we should not be afraid of this future. Robots are not going to become self-aware. They will help us, support us, assist us at work and in everyday life. Thank you so much. <laughs>